groups. Recording in progress. I see you coming in. I'm so excited. This is the first day of professional development boot camp. Okay, before I get started with my script here, let me tell you, we have 366 people registered for this workshop. <laughs> Way to go, guys. Way to go. Way to go. You've been spreading the word and you've been registering and um, I'm so grateful for all of your support. Uh, some of you who have been members of FUEL for a while know that originally Professional Development Bootcamp was an in-person event over five days. So Monday through Friday, we would do three workshops each day for a total of 15. Typically, we would get around 1,000 registrations, and we always thought maybe it would be more if we didn't have the capacity restrictions of you know, the rooms and spaces that we're in. Well, we found out that that was true. Last year was our first year doing this virtually. We have 1,400 registrants. This year, we're already at 1,700 registrants. And I am just blown away. We'll have more because people will continue to register. But thank you. Thank you already for making this a success. I just wanted to thank you all for um, being here. All right, so let's get to it. My name is Corey Jo Biddle, and I'm the executive director of Fuel Milwaukee. Fuel Milwaukee is an affiliate of the Metro Milwaukee Association of Commerce, where I also serve as VP of Community Affairs. And I got to give a shout out to MMAC for their support from day one of Professional Development Bootcamp. Without their support, we would not have been able to make this happen. By now, you know that this year, Professional Development Bootcamp is a multi-day virtual conference, and we've always been focused on career development for Milwaukee professionals. That means you. So between now and Friday, there are more workshops for you to participate in, all scheduled so that you don't have to miss work or use your PTO. And thanks to our sponsors, speakers, and network of local companies, Bootcamp is completely free for everybody who wants to participate. You can consider it a New Year's gift from the business community. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now let's recognize our PD Bootcamp sponsors. Returning as presenting sponsor this year is Marquette University's Graduate School of Management. I mean, they've been hanging with us for years, making this possible at a very high level. Appreciate their support. The Graduate School of Management is home to nationally ranked part-time MBA and executive MBA programs, as well as world-class master's programs in accounting, applied economics, corporate communication, finance, management, 
supply chain, and they also offer graduate certificates and joint MBA programs with law, political science, and nursing. If that sounds like something that you want to learn more about and you want to go back to school, you need to check out the Marquette University's Graduate School of Management. I'll drop their um, website in the chat, but they'll be easy to find with a Google search. Also returning as a supporting sponsor is American Family Insurance. That was pretty good, right? And <laughs> family. AmFam is well known for their corporate responsibility efforts and their passion for coming together with customers, employees, and agency owners to drive positive economic, social, and environmental change for our communities. We've all seen American families present in the community and they've done a lot for Milwaukee with deep roots here. So shout out to them and thanks for their continued support of boot camp. Check them out at amfam.com for all your insurance needs. Well, new to the bootcamp family as a supporting sponsor is Mandel Group. Mandel has luxury apartment communities. And if you've ever been in one of these apartments, you know that they are luxury, they are beautiful. Great locations, great amenities. Um, they have locations throughout the Milwaukee area, including downtown Milwaukee, Shorewood, West Dallas, Wauwatosa, Brookfield, Hales Corners, Franklin, and Oconomowoc. So no matter where you wanna be in the Milwaukee area, Mandel has the perfect, beautiful apartment for you. Visit them at mandelgroup.com to learn more. Now we're a tight knit family around here. So our sponsors love to support you guys and they come back year after year to support you. Uh, 88.9 Radio Milwaukee is no exception. They are returning as our media sponsor. Now through music and stories created for a culturally open-minded community, 88.9 Radio Milwaukee is a catalyst for creating a better, more inclusive and engaged Milwaukee. Be sure to tune in to the radio station at 88.9 and the website, radiomilwaukee.org. Lots of great stories and music on the website too. So don't forget about that. Thanks to our sponsors. Now, this is about you. We want you to get comfortable and really enjoy your time today and the space is yours. You know, in this world, the virtual world, that means getting in the chat room. That's why we got you in there telling us what you have for lunch and what are you doing after this workshop? What are some of your workplace challenges? Anything that comes to mind that you want to share, go to the chat and do that. You can interact with each other, give feedback on this wonderful speaker's presentation, whatever is on your mind. You can say, hey, man, brother, I understand what you're saying. Go to the chat and do that. If you have a question, go to the Q&A. The last 15 minutes of our discussion today, we'll go to the Q&A and pull your questions from there and um, have Alan answer those questions, okay? All right. Now, the reason why we're here Dr. Alan Patterson is the founder of Mentore, which is really beautiful. Love that name. Now, he has more than three decades of international consulting experience in change management, leadership development, and executive coaching. He formed Mentore as a consulting practice focused on aligning strategy, or organizational structure, job responsibilities, skill sets, and the major shift that we're all here to learn about, right? Technical expertise to strategic leadership. He has also served as adjunct faculty in the MBA programs of the UW Systems, Bryant University, and Leslie University. I'll let him talk a little bit more about himself because he has an amazing story and a fascinating Southern accent that I think we all want to learn more about. And thank you all for being here. And thank you, Dr. Allen, for being here. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and then go right into your presentation. The time is yours. I, I, I grew up a Southern boy coming out of the Western part of North Carolina. Uh, people say, well, why did you move to, the, to Wisconsin? I said two reasons and two reasons only. One, I wanted to experience endless winter. Well, today that's made possible. And two is I wanted to see more roadkill than I'd ever seen in my entire life. And that happens all the time, especially in the fall. People say, well, why would you move to Fond du Lac? Why would any man, masculine, any man move to, to, to a woman, someone I dated in college in Madison? That's the okay. story. That's the real story. And that's yeah. why I'm here. So yeah, I'm here. And thank you very much. Am I able to share my screen now? You can share your or screen. Okay. Well, I want to, first of all, thank Corey Joe for making this possible and welcoming all of you here. 
Uh, this is a real treat for me. This is a presentation that I do frequently. Uh, and working with people that are in young professional organizations right now is my thing. I, I <clears throat> love who you are. I love your attitude and I love what you're doing. I'm snarky. I don't want to get sarcastic. Um, I believe there's a lot of work to do. And I believe what you have in front of you is, is one of the most important and critical challenges that you face. Moving from a technical expert to a strategic leader really is very instructive about what skills you need to be successful moving forward in your career. I'd like to think that this is not the stuff they taught you in college. And unless you're lucky enough to have a really good boss, people really learn this by by trial and error. So I welcome your thoughts and comments along the way. Corey Joe is going to track those in the, the chat column in the Q&A. Uh, I will leave time at the end if I keep myself on, on target. And I'll also, uh, along the way, I want you to know I've got a couple activities here that you can use. We will make this presentation available to you and at the end, I'll talk to you about some exciting news for me about uh, another area and topic uh, that I'm uh, very interested in. So with that, let me start by saying technical experts. And when I say technical, I don't just mean people in IT or people that are in some type of scientific profession. I'm talking about the work that you do, the content of the work that you do. The reason that people succeed as experts in their field is because they can take their knowledge and expertise directly and get results. The difference is when you move into a strategic leadership position, like meaning a people management position, is that you are not doing the work. You have to create the conditions so that other people can succeed. That makes it a completely different job and a different skill set. It's not doing more of what you used to do. As a matter of fact, it's doing less of what you used to do and adopting some different skills and a different perspective and way to look at your job. Now, I've characterize this as saying it, it really involves a shift in, this, uh, in what technical expertise looks like. And then there's this humongous leap into something that is completely different that generally we call strategic leadership, uh, meaning being a part of a, an organization and also being one of the people that's helped driving the business, even though your job description or even though your manager or the organization itself doesn't tell you that you're running a piece of the business. I'm telling you, you are. And we'll talk about that when we talk about what's unique and different about that strategic uh, leadership position. Leadership is not a job. It's not a position. It's not something that people aspire to by looking at the organizational ladder and saying, okay, I wanna be a leader someday. Everybody, every job has leadership potential. And what I mean by that is that leadership is really a skill set. It's the ability to influence how people think and feel to the point they take decisive and responsible action. People can lead at any position inside the organization. So it's the emphasis on influence that becomes critical to the success in leadership. And that is a completely different skill set than just knowing a lot uh, and having a lot of experience. A lot, by the way, is a scientific word, Corey Joe. I learned that growing up in North Carolina. So when you think about leadership, I want you to consider three dimensions. One is job expertise. And you say, well, how does that, if leadership is influence, how is job expertise part of that? Well, it, it, for two reasons. One is you have to have a fundamental base of knowledge about your specialty, your area, your, your profession. And two is you have to have the credibility of the people around you. So you need to have that fundamental base. That alone doesn't give you leadership capability, but you won't have success as a leader unless there is that base of job expertise. The second is relationship management. 
Relationship management obviously is about building relationships. The, the key point here is building credibility. Job expertise relies heavily on competence, technical competence. Relationship management relies on credibility. And the third dimension is, I'm calling it business savvy, which is really a knowledge and understanding of the business that you're in. I know Corey Jo just briefly told me she's been in this role for several years, and it, you may not start there, it, and, and it doesn't matter. It's more about what you learn about the business or organization as you move through it that's different than just what you know about your specialty and how you manage the people around you. With those three dimensions, then, I can now describe four very distinct stages of leadership development. And I'm going to mention them now, and then I'm going to go into a little more detail here shortly on each one. We'll start at the bottom right, expertise. Expertise is about the content of the job. It's the knowledge, the experience. Uh, the expertise, obviously, that you build around your specialty. If you're at uh, the chamber, if you're a financial analyst, if you're a chemist, uh, if you're a, uh, even a, a business owner, you have to understand what are the basic fundamentals of what that job is and how things work. That's expertise. Credibility is different. Credibility is the stage of development where you're not looking at your success, you're looking at how you help make other people successful. And I'm going to spend a few more minutes on this because it's so essential. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, it's a different stage, it's a different skill set, it's a different perspective than just how smart you are and how much you know. And let me say now, and, and just reveal the biggest on a biggest secret that you probably know. There are only two people in the world that care if you're smart. One is yourself and the other is your mother because everybody else just really doesn't care. They care about how you can help them and that's credibility. When you move into the alignment and execution stage, you're talking about how do you achieve success through other people. So this is the people management part of the business. And that requires yet another set of skills that are critical uh, when you're doing the work yourself, that's the expertise part. And then finally, the fourth stage of leadership is strategy. And I don't mean your personal business strategy. I'm talking about strategic thinking, that broader business picture about or organizational picture about what makes that business successful and that can be sustained over time four distinct stages. If you look at the responsibilities within each one of those stages, this is just to get a flavor of what they are. Expertise is about staying up to date, uh, conveying timely uh, information, understanding the processes and procedures that you deal with, achieving results. You have control. When you're in this expertise stage, you have a, pretty much, I want to say 100%, sometimes it's not that full, but it's, it's you have control over the work and how that work gets done, unless you have a micromanager, and that's a whole different story. Credibility types of responsibility have to do with people and building relationships. How do you stay in front of the right people? How do you increase your visibility to senior management? Credibility credentials. What other credentials do you need that make you believable and trustworthy to people? Alignment and execution has to do with building team capability and capacity. So it's not about you. It's about how you infuse your knowledge into a team and how you then promote the operational side of the business to become more efficient and more effective. And then finally, the strategic or strategy role has to do with looking outside the business. Alignment and execution looks at the business or organization itself, while the more strategic perspective looks out. So each of these stages are different and unique. It's not as if you're going to move completely out of one and into another. And I, I wanted to illustrate that by thinking of some very specific examples of what jobs could look like. 
For example, if you were an analyst, and these are broad labels, you would think that your the roles and responsibilities you have, that the majority would be in that expertise quadrant, that stage, and, and they would be because you would be very hands-on uh, and transactional by, by design. There would be some need to build credibility, but there would be less on that more strategic side of running the business. When you look at the manager role, again, broadly speaking, the manager role really is building credibility with other people and also uh, creating the conditions for them to succeed, which is alignment and execution. So you would expect to see this profile shift that the context that you're working on is different. Do you need expertise? Well, you do. But when you start managing other people, the goal is that you're hiring people or working with people that know more than you, not less than you. And for some, that presents a problem. In my mind, and I'm encouraging to say, no, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. When you look at a director, directors inside organizations really are, are the, the, the crew, the people that are running the business. And that depends on how much they know about uh, how the organization operates. And then when you look, so it would be more in this top, uh, top left with more time spent on strategy than we've seen in the other roles. And the executive role really is facing that more strategic perspective. I'm speaking ideally. You can't see every position that says they're gonna fit this exact profile. This is not scientifically done. This is just to show you a difference in emphasis. It doesn't mean that they don't have credibility and it or, or have some level of expertise. It just means where they are more, most critical is in this top right strategy role because they're entrusted with running the business. So here's something I've created that you as an activity for you, not to do now, but something that you can do when you get the, this presentation. And it's a great thing to do for yourself and then to think about, could you do this and show it to your boss? The answer is yes. And that is first to plot, what do you see as your profile in your current job? How important is each one of these roles to the job? If you thought of a, a total percentage of 100, and draw what you see that four-sided figure look like, and then think about what do you think that role should be based on your knowledge and definition of the business. You'll have to educate, if you're speaking to uh, your manager, for example, you'll have to educate them on what these labels uh, are, the, the different uh, uh, stages, if you will, but it is really an interesting discussion to find out how much do you and your manager share in what those uh, your job is and what it should be. So if I can summarize the expertise stage, it answers the question what? What's the experience I need? What's the depth of knowledge that's required? How do I solve problems effectively, think analytically? How much am I uh, knowledgeable about the work itself, that subject matter? It does matter how smart you are here. So your mother's happy because you need to know and understand what's required, what needs to be replicated um, and, and known. And when you look at success, the measure of success here is based on your individual achievement. That's what expertise looks like. Okay, now, the first shift in your career, and it's not an all or nothing, but it's clearly directional, is moving from expertise to credibility. And the difference is, it's not how smart you are. It's not how good you are. It's not a, how much experience you are. There's no, in, it, there seems like there would be some type of entitlement because you know that, no more, and have done more. But what people judge credibility on is your ability to help them solve their problems. It is a completely different focus. 
It's what's the value that other people attribute to you? You say, well, that's their perception. That's exactly what it is. So you're not going to get there by thinking it's automatic. And so the, the difference is you're not focused on the what of the job, you're focused on who. And influence becomes the essential skill set here because it has to do with communication. You're talking about building relationships with the people around you and actually other people in the organization. So what you're getting better at, what you're getting smarter about is emotional intelligence, understanding people and understanding your impact on people. This is much different than analytical thinking. You have to know what's critical and important to your audience. You don't have to agree with it. As a matter of fact, there'll be some people you won't agree with ever. That's not the issue. The issue is, can you understand it? And the reason is it becomes a base for effective leadership. It's that ability to understand the perspective of others. So you'll be, you'll be judged, if you will, and valued because of how you deliver your knowledge and experience to other people. And the measure here is one of trust. And I'm not saying this will be scientific, but it will be something that's going to be critical in your, uh, in your progress as you move forward. And let me show you exactly what I mean by that. How do you develop credibility with other people? It's a simple formula and it's easily overlooked. It's not automatic. It's because you commit, you make a promise to others and then you deliver on that promise. Do you have to do both? Absolutely. Because if you just deliver and think somebody's going to know it without making a commitment, you've just lost a huge opportunity to, to help build your base of credibility. So track record and reputation and image and relationships, connection, network, you see all these relationships, that's what this stage is all about. What about your job? This becomes part of your job. It's not a separate to-do list. It's knowing who these people are that you need to be building relationships with. Additional experience will give you some credibility, but here's the problem for some people, not everyone. And I call this group the ones that where there's a failure to launch. What I mean by that is they spend so much time in building that additional knowledge and expertise, which is a good thing, but it's not the ticket to credibility. Credibility is using that to help other people. It's not automatic. And some people that think it's getting involved in that vortex and knowing more and, and uh, being better, uh, uh, having more uh, experience entitles them to credibility. And I'm, I'm sorry to say it doesn't happen that way. So as some, I want you to think about, it can help. But people translate value based really on your ability to commit and deliver to them. What gets in the way? What stops people from building credibility? Uh, it's that the power of that technical depth is very powerful, especially those of you that are in technical jobs. And I'm thinking uh, I've worked with people in IT and finance and accounting and scientists. And it's that there's such a lure and such a draw and not all, not everyone, but it's a powerful motivator that need to, to get uh, uh, technical and uh, depth and, and achieve more. There's also the tendency or the need for some people to feel they have to be the smartest person in the room. There's nothing worse than dealing with someone that has to prove to you, at least my experience, that they have to be the smartest person in the room. Most people don't care. They want to know if you can help them, not lecture to them. They're all, they also lack as a, as a something, as a barrier of the credibility to, uh, they're cl more clueless about their impact on other people. That really is a lack of emotional intelligence. So Corey, Joe, and I can be having a conversation. We just met. 
I start saying, no, you can't do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. We don't, we don't have the depth of relationship where I, I, can, <laughs> I can jump in and do that and not know that that has an impact. I may not think it's intentional, but nonetheless, not knowing your impact can be a, a major blind spot and something you want to think about as you build emotional intelligence. And then finally, I'll say there's some people that think I should not have to go out there and suck up or do anything that looks like that because a good job should speak for itself. Thank you, Corey Joe, that I can see you and see that the smile and the head nod. I'm in that school too. It's like, I shouldn't have to do that. Well, guess what? You do and you can do it and it's not sucking up. We'll have to say that for another time, but I'm just telling you, it's not automatic. There is no should. That's the issue that you're dealing with. Credibility is huge because it's the basis for building relationships and it's what's going to make you influential and help set you up for leadership positions. There's a means to this. It, this is not using people. This is not setting people up. I'm not trying to win you over simply to say, I'm going to sell you something, my ideas, my point of view. It's the way in which that level of trust runs what works well. And you've got to do it. You need to do it. We're going to change this world. We're going to change it because we understand it. And I put me in this same, this old guy here, put myself, I'm, I, I'm coming to the next meeting. So understanding relationship building and influence and leadership to me is what it's all about. It starts with the credibility side beyond just the knowledge side and the expertise side. What are the key skills here? It probably won't surprise you. A lot of it is, is really good communication skills. Two in particular. One is the ability to listen to people and the active listening. It is the most critical credibility skill that I, I would say. Not scientifically done, but there's a lot of research out there. There's nothing better than working with someone that is a good listener. It's the biggest compliment I think you, you can be paid or you can pay someone else. The other is influence, as I mentioned, which means you have to understand the perspective of other people. That's how you get them bought in. You don't have to agree with it. But unless you understand it, and here's a shot, here is a, a, a spoiler alert. If people don't feel, this is going to shock you. If people don't feel they're listened to, everything else turns to you know what. So you've got to master that skill. And there's a way to do it. We won't be doing that today, but active listening and effective influence and building relationships and getting buy and commitment are absolutely essential to move forward. I firmly believe that. I know that for, in my experience in working with clients. So I'm going to give you another assignment that you can use and think about three people you could build credibility with. Someone that's, in, uh, let's start down here. Someone in the critical path of your work. So I don't know, Corey Joe, you there's somebody you're working with uh, at, the, at the chamber and, and it's like, okay, I could know them better. And why would you do that? Because it's the relationship. You're not, at, you're not solving a problem. You're not asking there for something. You want to know more about them. I'm not saying you have to know their it, 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 personal life inside and out, but you're understanding what they're dealing with. Let's just keep it at work and what their frustrations are. And it's a basis upon which you can build credibility. <clears throat> Another person you can think about is somebody that needs to be in your network, somebody that's an influencer. You may not deal with them every day. Well, guess what? Find out who these people are, pick one, and see if you can set up a time and, and you can talk about, you want to understand the business better. You want to understand their role better. You have to have a reason to talk to them. You are not selling them anything and you are not asking them to give you something other than their perspective. And then there's someone you can think of building credibility that's important to your career. Who would that be? It could be somebody in the organization and maybe somebody outside. 
And I think the key there, the conversation, and this obviously all these can be more than one conversation. I think the conversation there needs to sound like getting their perspective on their career and empowering them to give you career advice. How is it that somebody moves from a finance and accounting background and moves into uh, um, more of a, a operational role or let's say a manufacturing role or taking over a department? How does that happen? If this person has done that, they will tell you. People like to talk about themselves and you will learn a lot. And what's the purpose here? To build relationships, to build credibility, to be able to expand your set of relationships that will expand your ability to lead and influence others. There's a reason for this. Now, the management role. Moving into management, and by management, I'm talking about managing other people. Um, it could also be managing projects, but particularly when you look at the, the jobs where you're taking over a group, it is a huge leap. And the reason I say this is the whole balance of what you're doing shifts. You have spent your career to this point, for the most part, building your base of personal competence. I don't care if it's one job or several. People say, how long does this take? I, I say it's somewhere between three and five years. I hope you don't faint. It takes time. Cre learning how to build credibility, it's not like you'll be in the same job necessarily, but to understand and work on that skill set beyond what you need to know about the organization and how things work and your, and your specialty takes time, but it's all based on you your ability to achieve and the personal competence. When you move in to a higher level in the organization, it's not about you. It's not about your personal success. It's how much can you build the capacity of the organization? It's a different responsibility. So the measures of what, how you judge success are different and the role that you have are different because you're moving from first violinist to orchestra conductor. And the difference there is you don't play in the orchestra. You're not doing, you're setting up the conditions for others succeed. Where it gets confusing, and I, I can only imagine if I asked for a show of hands, it would flood, flood, <laughs> flood the chat. How many of you have a management job, a job, but you're still expected to produce something, still expected to do work. That's a hybrid role. I, I can't, those roles stink. Those roles are hard. How do you know how much time you need to be doing something and it as opposed to managing other people? I'm not saying you're going to avoid that. I, I can appreciate why those roles can be confusing especially when you think about what happens to some people. I've called them the four biggest mistakes of first-time managers, not just first-time, it's people that can't get out of playing that role of doing something, not just because it's being demanded, but also because it's their nature, it's their comfort level. So you look at what those tend to be, I, the biggest ones I see clearly beyond a shadow of a doubt, the biggest, toughest hurdle for many first time managers is a failure to delegate. There's too much of an emphasis that's, that is placed and this is more internal pressure to get the work done and to do it yourself, especially if it means training other people because it, it ends up being easier to do yourself. Well, you don't build capacity that way. The second is to be the uber achiever, or, and, or, or another way of thinking of this is to be the answer. Everybody's a question, and you have to be able to answer that. You have to be able to do everything that everybody else that's working for you does. Says who? Where did that come from? You need to be able to create the conditions for them to succeed, not be able to simply say, oh, I can fill in, I can do their job. I don't know that that to me is not a requirement. They can make you smart, 
but they, you don't have to be the uber achiever. I think another uh, major mistake for first time managers is they really don't understand that people look at them differently. This is particularly true if you've risen up through the ranks and someone has, and you've taken on a new role as manager of the group you used to work for, they don't see you the same way. You could be good old Alan and go out and have a beer and glass of wine and say, it's gonna be the same. It's not gonna be the same. And I don't mean that they'll, they'll be disrespect or they won't appreciate what you do. It's just, you have a different role. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, I want you to think about that. What is your role? I'm not saying you can't socialize with people that you have been your coworkers. I think that's often a question. You just need to appreciate and understand you have a different type of responsibility. And then the last has to do with really the micromanagement side of life. And that is where you focus only on getting the task done, especially if you're a high achiever. High achievers know how to get work done. And most likely, most likely the people that had been promoted into these jobs of managers had been the best individual contributors, the smartest, the best, the brightest, not always but there definitely is that trend. So that's what's made you successful that in the past. It, that's not gonna make you successful in the future. Nobody that is good at their job wants to be micromanaged and people know that and experience that every day. So going in and telling somebody how to do something that's been doing it for however long because you're your manager, that's not your role. Your role is to understand them and what needs to happen well enough so that you can run interference and break down barriers and help that person be successful. So alignment and execution looks at a different condition. It's how. How does the work get done through other people? Orchestration, I chose that word for a reason because things change. You want to call it change management, change leadership, call, call it any and all of those things. It's the ability to adjust and adapt. That's the agility part. You are looking at alignment. Sorry, you're not just looking. <clears throat> sorry about jumping around here. You're not just looking at results. You're looking at the conditions for results. You can't take great people and have lousy processes and think they're going to be successful. So what do you do? Change the people. No, you don't change the people. You change the process. You have people that don't have the skill set. Okay, you're going to develop it or you're going to go out and buy the skill set. So that's what I mean by alignment. It's a systems approach. It's broader than just doing something. So when change hits, you know, change management, it's a big deal. And I, I haven't talked about it here. Another discussion. I'm, I'm just booking up discussions, Corey Joe. What I'm, what I'm saying is culture's in that same boat. The culture is not going to fix everything. And it's not going to fix everything right away because there's so many moving parts. It's a systems approach, and it really focuses on the organization and this effectiveness in creating these conditions. So capacity is an issue. And I don't just mean how many widgets can you get out. I'm talking about talent development, too. How do I increase the, the, the skill and competence of the people that work with me? around me, for me. Some, most think of this as reporting to you. Others think of all, all the people around you that you potentially can impact. So this shift up into this more strategic leadership perspective has two dimensions. One was alignment and execution, which I mentioned. And the other, the last is this strategic business perspective. Back to my good colleague now, uh, Corey Joe, this is about the success of your business, of your organization, not just your personal success. Well, what does that mean? It means you are tapped because of your knowledge about the business and what the business represents or what this organization that you're responsible for that's here today. What, what are the trends? What are the, the, the issues? What are the, what's going on in the outside world that will impact 
you, the success of what you're doing with your uh, responsibilities. And we can get into all kinds of things about flexible work schedules, great resignation, all this stuff that's going on. It's real. You have to know those. You have to understand that and understand the impact, which is broader than just simply doing what you do. So strategy gets us at the big why question. Why am I doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? It requires some knowledge and insight. It's really hitting strategic thinking and the ability to see the bigger picture, connect the dots, anything we wanna say along those lines. So it creates the need for you to operate at a higher level. You're not just, it's not longevity that makes you good at a strategic position. It's your understanding of what's going on in the business and the impact that factors outside the organization can and will have. You say, well, that's risk-taking because you don't know these for a fact. It's your best judgment on what that looks like. So when you sit at the table and you've come up, say, through the IT ranks and now you're the chief of, uh, of uh, IT, the, the uh, chief uh, IT officer, and you're there because you understand the business and your value is to help direct the business with the knowledge of what your specialty is and what that's gonna mean. So sustainability, organizational sustainability becomes a measure for success. That's the difference. You're moving from personal competence to organizational capacity, different skill set different requirements. It's not about digging deeper into your job. It's about expanding your personal competence and then working with an organization to build the capacity, not just of your team, but of the business. This last, close to the last slide I've included, and when you get the presentation, I hope this is helpful in the sense that you can look across this and say, okay, well, What's different about these? Because they really are different. And they require, as I, and the reason for drawing that profile, like I asked, uh, gave with that very first activity, is because you'll see that this changes over time. You're not leaving expertise behind completely or, or uh, credibility completely. It's just the nature <clears throat> and, the, and the relationship. And it really boils down to, where and how and with whom do you spend your time? That's ultimately what it looks like. It's the day, the week, the month. Um, where do you go from here? I encourage you, uh, I've given this to clients. You, it's up to you whether you use these activities or not. I just wanted you to have something that'll, that could be a reminder of what we talked about and what, what this looks like. Now, I said there's more. Well, I'm excited to say that I actually wrote uh, Leader Evolution uh, back in 2016. I've been talking about this topic for years. And people had said, well, I don't know. Do you have a book? It's OK. I'll write a book. What the heck? Why not? So I did that. And my latest topic and in interest uh, will be out in, in the form of a, a new book, Burn Ladders, Build Bridges. And it's the inspiration that I'm getting and really he picked up on um, to a great extent that you reflect, but also many others in the workplace that say, you know what, I, I, I'm not, let me make one caveat. This is not saying that meaning and purpose to find everybody's job. People have to work. People need a pay paycheck. People need to pay the bills, need a safe place to live. All those are important critical requirements. So those come first. I'm saying when you have the, the, the cap when you are thinking about your job in terms of does this have meaning? Is this what purpose I get? I'm going to suggest to you there's a different way to get it than climbing the corporate ladder. Um, and a lot of it has to do with starts with that building credibility and building relationships. And finally, if you go to ladderburners.com slash fuel, that's for you guys. 
Um, happy to for you to download something here. This is all opting in, so I'm going to leave this up to you, uh, and you can feel free to reach out to me. I, I name myself Trouble, trouble at ladderburners.com, so uh, you can reach out that way. So I'm here. I'm at the end. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted, but I'm wide awake and happy with your help, Corey Joda. Let's take some questions or answer some comments that people have. Okay, so I got I have some questions in the Q&A right now, but I have to remark on the number of comments in the chat. People are blown away by this content. I'm putting the links in there to the website that you, the Ladder Burner site and your book. And my good friend, Kim Hiddle from UWM is the one that told me about you. And that's why I didn't question the content because I know her. And I'm like, awesome. I'm like, whatever. If she says it, then it's going to be awesome. But for real, this is like, huh, I can't wait to like work all this stuff out about my own career and journey. Kim posted that we should join you um, in your class from technical expert to strategic leader at UWM's uh, School of Continuing Education. And she posted the link in there. So as we go to the questions, I just want to remind folks that this is about you. It's about you being able to learn something in a quick 60 minutes and get back to work and have been enhanced in that session. But it's also about making you aware of who is available to you in terms of professional development, coaching, um, and mentoring. I definitely want you to keep Dr. Allen in mind and don't be stingy. Share the links and talk to your HR and managers and leadership in your organization. And we'll about be sure that... I'm sorry, uh, Corey, to interrupt you, Corey Joe. Uh, we'll make the presentation available to people. Yep, I'll send that was the you and first question here. Yes, the presentation will be available. Uh, Rebecca wants to know how long do you think it takes to build credibility when you are new in a role, team, or job? I think it depends on the person you're talking about. Um, it takes months. Uh, I wouldn't say it takes years. It's you have to find a reason. You have to be able to commit and deliver to people. And so you start by doing good work. That's for sure. You, you demonstrate competence to other people. And that will give you credibility. So track record and reputation are important. But those don't happen overnight. People need to see it and believe it. And then when they start to count on you. So I, I would be very mindful about who those people are to build credibility. I'm not saying that that means there's certain people you ignore. I'm just saying that think of this as um, a process, if you will, and because it has to build up. People need to see it more than once. So if you're new, give yourself, see where you are in six months. Find a, find a, a buddy. It would be great to have your manager be able to weigh in. That doesn't always happen. But you'll get a sense uh, of if people are, uh, trust you and that's what you want to see. I, what I like about this approach, it, is, it really is like a strategy for your own development. I think so often we hear the terms visibility and networking and, it's, and it, it has this little stink to it, like it's fake or plastic or you're being phony somehow. And I think sometimes it has been taught or, or projected in that way to people that's where we got the connotation from. But this is this feels totally different. It's like authentic, but it's it's okay to have a strategy for your career. You just, you know, you, gotcha. you owe that to yourself, right? Yeah, precisely. And you need to control that. You need to own that. Your company, you can work for a great company, and many of you are. They they're not gonna care more about your career than you are. So taking control of that is I, I to me is essential. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Uh, let's see the next question. Someone says, I give people genuine compliments when they deserve it, but how do you approach someone and get close to them and advocate for yourself in a professional way? Uh, they said the good way of sucking up to someone, so to speak. <laughs> I think you have to be able to talk about your accomplishments and achievements and the work that you've done with others. And it's not that you can't claim the credit uh, for yourself. It's talking about the excitement and the results that you got 
And it could be around, it could be around a personal assignment, but rather than say, okay, look how good I am, you're letting people know how much it means to you to be able to deliver something that's meaningful and important. And, and that's a good way of sucking up. <laughs> yep. There's another interesting question. Um, it's kind of a question comment. Work ethic, ethic builds credibility, but sometimes hard workers are overlooked for various reasons. Now that that's really interesting to me because I remember the period of time when I was in that mode of like I I'm working hard and I shouldn't have to go out here and promote myself. I'm not a PR department and and I really did I really did resist it. And somebody told me you have to stop doing that. It was a it was a fuel member, and he said you have to stop doing that. And I resisted it. And as soon as I stopped, um, it was like a humility, uh, a false humility almost. Like I felt like if I wasn't humble, that somehow made me a jerk. And that if I said anything about the work that I was doing, that that also made me a jerk. And as soon as I stopped doing that, things totally changed for, for fuel and for me. Yeah. Uh, it, it, hard work won't get it. You have to be with someone that appreciates hard work. And, and you could say, well, I get results. Even that is not going to cut it. It's people, people get promoted and, and move on in their careers, not because of simply what they've done, it's the judgment by others of what you've done. Mm -hmm. And that's the political reality that gets us into a lot of discussions. Mm -hmm. So you think you're sucking up? You're not sucking up. It's just that a good job does not speak for itself. It, 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 there's no should. I, I wish, I mean, I, Listen, I learned this the hard way. I, I, I think anybody that's considers themselves a good doer or a high achiever thinks I shouldn't have to do that. Well, you just gave a testament about why you have to. That's right. Someone's asking about uh, building capacity on their team by being a better delegator. Are there resources in your books or other resources that you know of that can help new managers better delegate? Yeah, I, and in Leader Revolution, I talk about delegation and what you have to do. And um, it, it really, it's, there's not one size fits all. It's going to depend on the, the uh, experience level of the person that you're dealing with and also how easy or complicated, let's say, the responsibility is. But delegating for development is a great tool. It's giving someone something to aspire to and coaching them along the way uh, as a way that both delegates and develops their, their capability. And, and you want to take somebody that's a, a good worker, a, a hard worker, a high achiever, they couldn't ask for anything more along with recognition for a job well done. That's, that's good leadership. So that, that's, you're, you're being that person that you would expect other people to be and may not be by not recognizing hard work. What a great motivation to do it is helping somebody else. Not just yeah. not just getting stuff off your plate, but helping to no. develop somebody else. Precisely. Yeah. Someone says, can you talk about micromanagement versus quote unquote asserting your authority uh, <laughs> when you rise up through the through the ranks? I, I I'm not sure what's meant by asserting your authority. There's always the issue of how things are stated and said. Micromanagement in my mind, the way I define micromanagement is telling you exactly what to do and exactly how to do it. And for someone capable, that stinks. For someone new, micromanagement is a good thing. But asserting, you assert your authority with every, and potentially within every conversation relationship you have with your group with your team by choosing how how much you uh, engage people with knowing their capability and what they can handle and do and how much input they have you're still in charge and guiding that conversation in direction even if you say well it's up to you you decide and just inform me of the decision so I think the authority is not a plateau. You don't say, okay, either have authority or not. You have authority. You, 
that is part, that's your responsibility. But how you do that becomes really key. And micromanagement to me is specifically, here's what I, I want you to do and here's how I want you to do it. And, and then come back to me and let's take a look. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna combine two questions as we're running short on time. Um, there's questions about, you know, the, the columns are really neat when you present, but it could be messy <laughs> in your actual career, right? So somebody wants to know, are you, you know, do you have to go from column to column or step to step if you kind of see I'm missing one piece here and there? And I'll combine that with this other question about how do you work this plan with your, with your HR or uh, manager? I, I, HR, I'm not sure about, okay? Manager, I'm very sure about. And it's a great question because this isn't like, you have to understand what your job and role is and who you have to interface with in order to be the most effective. The appreciation of your experience and knowledge over time is not as an expert, it's as a business person. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's your knowledge of, of your specialty. So. I think it's a matter of sitting down with your manager and clarifying the expectations of your role. And when you're thinking about where you're headed or what, where you can, I don't know, let's use provide the most value. I think this is literally, what do I do? What are the skills and, and knowledge I need to be successful? Big on the skills and behaviors. What do I have? What does success look like? And the question rarely asked is, and who do I need to be interface, interacting with in order to make that happen? So it is messy, but if, it, it's not if you understand, even if you're an individual contributor with 25 years of experience, a high level individual contributor, I will still say your value is your knowledge and understanding and experience about your specialty applied to the business not just how much you know. Yep, that is so, oh, it's so true. It's so true. We could talk forever about this. Let's do it. <laughs> we got to get together because I'm thinking I can design so many things just around the conversation that we had today. You are amazing. Well, and we are so glad you. that you came to Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> God bless the roadkill and, and endless winter and the woman I'm with. <laughs> Amen. Amazing. Guys, go to the chat, drop love notes right there. So uh, <laughs> Alan can know the impact. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of love notes in there already, but go well, ahead. Yeah. And I'm, excuse me for cutting you short. Yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions, get them in the chat and Corey and I'll, uh, Corey Joe and I'll work out how I get them and I'll, I'll get back to you. Absolutely. We're going to get these questions. We'll get the slides to you and, uh, and the, the replay. And again, check out the website, the books. If just half of us buy the book that was on here, we'll sell a hundred books. So I'm going to just challenge us to get that done. I dropped the link. There's, you know, there's really There you no go. Way. Thank you. That's me, by the way. That's me before I, before I went out on my own. I was an angry young man. Angry. <laughs> You're much more peaceful now. Thank you. Listen, Thanks, thank you so much. Okay. You are amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. You're so awesome. Okay, this was number two uh, in our workshop and boot camp series tonight. Number three is at five o'clock. We're talking about the inclusive leader maximizing the mix. That's going to be very interactive breakout rooms and running scenarios. It's going to be a lot of fun. So check that out. In addition to the rest of the boot camp week, I have to thank our sponsors again, Marquette, American Amer Marquette's Graduate School of Management, American Family, 88.9, and Mandel Group. Thank you so much. All right, you guys got to get back to work. We'll let you go. Thank you all for being here. Spread the word and register for more. Dr. Allen, I, listen, I will be on your line. As soon as we get done with this boot camp stuff, I'll be stalking you because we need Good. more of you. I, I need that. I want that. <laughs> I think you're Thank awesome. You. And I think everyone is awesome that participated. Thanks for all the love notes and all the comments. And we will see you today at five o'clock. Ciao. Bye. All right, Jacqueline, I see your question. He also said that he would answer some questions afterwards too. So I'll leave this open for a few seconds for 
those that are still here, if you want him to follow up with you with your questions, go ahead and drop them. Drop them now. I'll make sure he gets them. Wasn't this great? Oh, I learned so much. You're welcome. And thank you all for being here. I learned a lot. I can't wait to start mapping out my expertise and skills and competencies. All right. Is that everybody? I think I got all the questions, all the comments. Hey, David, I miss seeing you. The last time we, we listen, it's been a, it's been a while. We gotta, we gotta hang out. Thanks, Orville. What a great speaker he was. I can't wait to start doing in-person events with you all again. I miss seeing your face, faces. See you later, guys. Bye.